Hello, here we are for part 5 of lecture 14 of C and G 4412 steel and concrete design. Alright, so what I want to do here is I want to continue on and uh, work through a longer form example on the uh, design of steel beams. I need a few more slides this time. Okay, so this is just going to be a simple long form design example. And we're recording, so we're good. Okay, so let's work through this. And this is going to be a relatively simple beam, but we're going to look at a few things. Uh, and when I say design example, what I'm really looking at is I want to look at how we can design a steel beam in terms of sort of a blank sheet, or how we can, uh, given just a dimensions and loading, how can we uh, uh, arrive quickly at the design of a or selection of a particular steel section. So steel beam design. Steel beam design. So this is going to be given first. Let me sh let's just use the old given find format right here. Given and find. Okay. So uh, let's see. And let's draw the beam out. Let's just go with a relatively simple, nice, friendly, simply supported beam. Like this. And we have a few point loads P. And this P is going to consist of a mixture of dead and live. So point load P, point load P, and point load P. And uh, P is going to be made of two things, a dead load equal to 10 kips, and a live load equal to 17.5 kips. A live load equal to 17.5 kips, and we'll need the dimensions as well, so let's, let me mark those on there. Uh, this is going to be 10 feet, 10 feet, 10 feet, and 10 feet. So relatively simple beam. And then, then what we want to find then what we want to find, we want to find the lightest section to carry the loads. Relatively simple. The lightest section to carry load, to carry these loads. So we want to select the largest steel section, or sorry, the lightest steel section to carry these loads. And we'll just go ahead and assume a W section for simplicity. Okay, so um, let's see here. Now let's just, I'm gonna run through this using a step process. I'm gonna label individual steps, that sort of thing, as we go. So step one uh, here, well maybe I can go ahead and put solution, just to, so I use my given find solution format. And this is gonna be a relatively long example, so you might wanna get a snack. And so step one, Step one, uh, load analysis. Get your loads. Now, uh, for a more complicated frame, if you had a, say, a frame of a structure, that sort of thing, you would need to use some sort of structural analysis in order to actually get the individual loads, the loads and individual members. But here, this is already done. This is already done. Uh, this was given to us, essentially. And so we know that P dead is equal to 10 kips, and P live is equal to 17.5 kips. is equal to 17.5 kips. Uh, step two will be to calculate your dead load. Although uh, we'll come back to this later, but right now we'll calculate the dead load. But here we're just going to say it's uh, zero essentially. And well, at least in terms of the self weight. But when we'll come back, we'll, we'll kind of iterate around. But initially, uh, assume self-weight to be zero. Just ignore it right off the bat. Uh, initially, assume self-weight is zero. Uh, step three, 
load combinations, uh, load combinations, and for this particular one, uh, we'll get our P ultimate. And this one, well, we only have dead and live. Obviously, if we were doing a more complicated structure, real world, a real world structure, we would have to consider environmental loadings, etc. But here, our ultimate loading is simply going to be 1.2 dead, uh, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. So that's 1.2 times 10 plus 1.6 times 17.5. And that comes to an overall point load of 40 kips. That's not the total load in the structure, but that is the uh, that is the uh, the factored point load. Then uh, we're going to do the same thing we've always done, at least. In, and this goes back to way way back to statics, and that's going to that's going to be to draw your shear and bending moment diagrams. So our V and M diagrams. Step four: draw V and M diagrams. Uh, draw V and M diagrams. Now, I think at this point you know how to do shear and bending moment diagrams. Uh, this is a senior level class, and so statics was several courses ago. Um, I trust by now that you know how to do uh, shear and bending moment diagrams. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw it. I, I will go ahead and give those to you so you can go ahead and check it. Uh, you can, I would like you to run through this if you can. I'm talking to my students in the current semester. Uh, go ahead and run through this if you can, but then uh, make sure you know where all these numbers are coming from. So I'm going to first just draw the loads, and we'll have 40 kips, 40 kips, and 40 kips. And in turn, we'll have reactions. This is a nice symmetric beam. We'll have reactions of 60 feet and 60 feet. Oh, I do actually need to modify this as well as slightly. Sorry about that. Let me go back here and modify this. In the given, uh, I should also state that uh, the beam is braced where P is applied. That will be important later. laterally braced. So that'll be important for our uh, moment calculations, lateral torsional buckling, etc. Uh, then let's get the shear diagram. So we have that. And then we'll get the shear V. And this isn't really too bad. Shear diagrams here are very simple. Point load, shear diagrams or point loads are very simple. Uh, we're just going to pop up to 60 initially. We're going to remain constant until this is the first P. Then we will drop down to 20. Remain that. Uh, well, well, actually, maybe show it a little bit further down. Show that a little bit. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and add a few of my. Uh, well, I like to do this when I'm drawing shear and bending mode diagrams. I add sort of like sort of. I, I like to add some sort of trace lines to keep everything more or less aligned vertically. And I'll do that here as well. These don't signify any loading. These are just lines on the page to help me sort of keep everything more or less aligned. And so then, again, we're initially at 60. Then we're level because we don't have any other. We don't have any distributed load. Then we drop down to 20. Then we're going to remain constant over to the next point load. So this is 20. Then we're going to drop down another 40, down to negative 20. Then we're constant over here. And then we drop down to negative 60, and then we remain there until we pop back up to zero at the end. Negative 60 and negative 20 here. And then uh, we can also draw the moment diagram. And it's also going to be relatively simple. Just some para uh, nice parabolas. Actually, sorry, not even parabolas, linear functions. I know how to do shear and bending moment diagrams. Uh, linear functions. And this can be done just by the area method. Uh, we, of course, know that uh, 
the change in, moment, in a moment diagram is equal to the area under the shear diagram. This here has an area of 60 times 10, so we're, we know that from here to here, it's going to increase by 600 or increase up to 600. This is going to be 600. Oh, and of course, this is in kips. And this is in kip feet. Uh, kip feet. Then from here to here, uh, we know the area of this is 20 times 10, so 200. And so we're going to increase up to 800 at the middle of the beam. And that's going to be sort of our maximum moment present anywhere. That's going to be our maximum moment. And uh, let's see. That'll be 800. And then we're going to drop back down to 600 and then drop back down to zero. So the thing is actually going to be, this beam is going to be in positive bending throughout, uh, but we do have different levels of moment here. And so we do have positive bending throughout the beam. Positive bending. Okay, so um, now what I'm going to do is I am going to label these, I'm going to label sections of the beam, uh, maybe one, two, three, and four. And I'm going to use this for a table that I'll create uh, on the next page. I'm going to label uh, the span between the braces. Maybe I'll label this one, two, three, and four. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this, or the difficult thing about this, is that we effectively need to figure out which span is critical. And the way we do that is, uh, it's not just a matter of which moment is the maximum. So if you're talking about just simple max moment, then yes, that's all that matters. Um, we can just say, oh, max moment is 800, boom, boom, we're done, no problem. But uh, but how can we say, how should we say, uh, but when you're dealing with uh, beams that have, have bracing along the way, uh, or when we start worrying about lateral torsional buckling and things like that, not only does it matter what the actual maximum moment is, it matters what the distribution of moment is uh, along a, between a set of spans, or between a span, or in particular between two braces. And so I'm going to have this, and I, should, I shouldn't use the word span, that's kind of an improper word in this context. I should say the distance between, basically just part of the beam one, part two, part three, part four, the distance between, uh, part of the beam spanning between uh, two braces, or basically the un each unbraced section. So step five here is going to be to create a table of uh, MU over CB. Uh, step five, calculate M ultimate divided by CB. See, the interesting thing about this is that you might have a beam. So we were, we uh, knew pre we saw previously that a distributed moment is better for lateral torsional buckling. Uh, the more your, your moment is spread out, the higher your capacity will be in lateral torsional buckling. So it is conceivable that the, that the span that has the maximum moment isn't actually critical for lateral torsional buckling. You could have a span or a section of a beam or an unbraced span or an unbraced length that maybe it has slightly less moment than another portion of the beam, but because the moment is, is more concentrated, maybe that span is what's going to be critical. So basically, I'm going to create a little table, or I'm going to create a little table that, uh, or in other words, I calculate uh, LB, uh, M ultimate, and CB for each segment. And that's the word I should, I'm looking for. Not span, but segment is probably a better word. So let's work through this. Nice vertical line there. Okay, and I'm going to do this for, uh, let's see, this gonna, needs to be four by four. And this is going to be segment one, two, three, and four. And then I'll have LB, the unbraced length, M ultimate, the ultimate moment present anywhere along that span. Uh, then I'll have CB, which is calculated from the formulas we, from the formula we saw previously, and, and I believe 
uh, part two or three of this lecture. And then I'm also going to cal calculate the ratio m ultimate divided by cb, mu over cb. And uh, this is a relatively simple beam. So our first of all, our lb is going to be the same for all of these. It's going to be just nice, simple 10 feet here. So 10 feet, 10 feet, 10 feet, and 10 feet. And then again, for the max moment, the MU, we use the maximum moment that is present at any location along that uh, segment. So this would be 600, and this is going to be in kip feet. So 600, 800, 800, and 600. And if you go and calculate the CVs, you will find, uh, basically, you would need to divide each segment up into the quarter points and look at the moment at that. So again, CV is calculated per unbraced length. It's not calculated over the entire length of the beam. Uh, we'll have this particular beam could have four different CV values on it. And the values that we get are 1.67, 1.11, 11.5, uh, it is nice and symmetric, thankfully, keeps things relatively simple, and again, 1.67. And then if you divide these out, we get 359. And these are also going to be in kip feet. Uh, kip feet here. Uh, this is, of course, CB is unitless. So 359. Uh, 359, it is still symmetric. And 720 and 720. And so we see that the middle span, actually the middle segments, I keep saying uh, span, i got to be more precise with my language. But uh, anyway. Okay. Let's see, and the reason we did this, why did we do this? What are we doing here? Fundamentally, the reason we're doing this is that I'm going to use this MU over CB to calculate uh, or to select an initial, um, an, an, an initial section. This won't be enough to prove that the section is adequate, but it will serve as a very useful initial sizing. So step six. Uh, step six, uh, basically, I find, find a beam, a section, uh, that has phi mn with phi mn greater than or equal to uh, rmu over cb, but with cb equal to 1.0. Or in other words, I'm going to look for, uh, I'm going to use... I uh, use, let's say, uh, I could use table 3-10. 3-10, uh, looking for, and again, look, look, if we look on table 3-10 in the steel manual, going back here, and this has our W shapes listed by unbraced length. And this is on page, uh, let's see, where's the start of that table? Where it's that's a big old more of a graph than a table, but it's labeled a table. Um, and then that's pa found on page uh, so it's table three ten, and it's found on page three ninety two of the fifteenth edition. And so essentially, uh, we're looking for the idea here is that this table uses a CB of one point oh. So we don't want we we don't want to use a CB of one point oh because that's going to end with with a. Uh, this table is not going to be able to accommodate our, our CB value that we previously got of 1.11 or 1.67, etc. It's built for 1.0. So instead, we're going to say what, what section would have the same ratio of capacities uh, if it did have a CB of 1.0. And then we'll just use that to select our initial size, and then we'll check everything. Okay. Or in other words, in this particular example, what we're looking for is what do we want? Well, we want a, uh, using this table, I want to look for a section, uh, a section with uh, phi mn greater than, greater than 720 with an unbraced length equal to 10 feet. Uh, unbraced length equal to 10 feet. So greater than 720 kip feet. So as I scrolled along, we can see that as we go along the pages, the capacity decreases as we go along, as it, as it go down. So uh, let's keep going. 
and see what we can find. So 720, and we're looking for an unbraced length of, uh, um, we're looking for an unbraced, uh, we're looking at an unbraced length of 10 feet, and we're looking for, for something that has a, that has a capacity there pretty close to 720. Uh, because we don't, we could go higher, of course, but that would result in something that's stronger than we need, uh, much stronger than we need. Okay, so we have different options here. Let's see what we can find. Um, let's see, what, how do we want to go along this? Now, looking at this, right at 720, right at the, now, interestingly, uh, right at the intersection here at unbraced length of 10 feet, uh, as I go up at 720, uh, let's see, would this work? Would W14 by 109 work? 720. That's an unbraced length of 10 feet. Um, let's see, perhaps. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, I see here. And let's give this a try. Okay. So, looking here. Now, I have one thing in my notes that was based on a different uh, uh, earlier version of the manual, so this is maybe going to differ slightly than what we have. So let's look at this. 14 by 109. And again, you see that uh, basically what these what these graphs are. This is our graphs that we talked about previously where we have uh, basically the, uh, if you remember functions as uh, capacity as a function of brace length, where they did this sort of thing here. Initially they were... Um, your capacity here initially it was plastic moment and then it was linear and then it sort of drops off uh, logarithmically or whatever you want to call it. These are basically those plots just plotted as a function of unbraced length. Just plotted as a function of unbraced length. And so, and of course the dashed lines are going to be the, uh, the, the uh, dashed lines are going to be not, are going to be too heavy or sorry, not going to be the lightest for a given unbraced length and capacity. Uh, so here, now um, here, if we look here, uh, we see that there is a uh, W14 by 109 right at 720. So if I look there, I have right at 720, uh, I have W, uh, I have a W14 uh, by 109 right at 720, at 720 uh, with LB equal to 10 feet. So what about that one? Well, we could use that one, but I actually don't want to use it because it's dashed. So I don't want to use that. Dashed means that for that given size, that for that given load and length, etc., that's not going to be the lightest one. So I would want to go, I would need to go for something, uh, preferably something higher. And let's see what we can find. So um, maybe a, uh, we're looking for a solid line rather than a dashed line. If I look at the W24 by 76, uh, that's not going to have the adequate capacity for a brace length of 10 feet. It looks like our best bet is going to be a W24 by 84. So I'm going to try working with a W24 by 84. Uh, that's, and again, this table is just useful for our initial sizing. So let's try a, try a W24 by 84. That is the, uh, when I scroll up, or when I, not scroll up, when I uh, trace up along the 10 foot line, uh, basically, or, or along the 10 foot uh, unbraced length, that is the first, uh, the W24 by 84 is the first solid line I find above uh, a capacity of 720. So we're gonna try W24 by 84. And uh, see, let's see here. And I also want to check uh, the plastic moment capacity. So I also want to verify that this is going to be greater than the value we have. That's I want to check that VMP is greater than our M ultimate because we because regardless of CB, I can't ever exceed my uh, my plastic moment. So I want to check to make sure that's true. And our M ultimate we had previously was uh, 800. And if you look on table 3.2 for this, uh, if you go to the section in that table, you will find that it has a capacity of uh, VMP 
equals uh, eight, uh, 840. And that is greater than this, so we're good. As a reminder, uh, you must maintain this. The design aids, uh, like I mentioned previously, are dangerous. They're dangerous because you need to be very aware of what you're doing. You can't just rely on them. Uh, we could very well a easily, we could very well end up in a case where we think we're okay, but we're not. So we gotta be, we have to be aware of the assumptions that go into these design aids and we have to be very cognizant of what we're doing. So uh, again, uh, CB allows us to uh, have a slightly higher capacity um, because of the moment distribution, but it doesn't ever allow you to exceed your plastic moment capacity. So that's why I'm going back uh, that's why I'm going back here and saying, okay, okay, what's our actual maximum moment and making sure that this is not going to exceed our plastic moment capacity. But, and this is before we finish, but this is just finishing up sizing. We're still going to actually have to make sure that we are okay in terms of strength, overall strength. Now, um, although this should be fine uh, in terms of strength, but we, so we know this is going to be fine in terms of strength, except what do we need to do in terms of strength? We need to do one other thing, and that's add back in our self-weight. So step seven. And if we wanted to, we could actually run through all of the calculations themselves, but those calculations are already kind of baked into our um, our LB, or sort of our M ultimate over CB. So once you've done that, if you do this method, you honestly really don't need to. But you do need to do one thing, and that is to... Uh, and that is to uh, go back and look at self-weight. Add self-weight in. And so, uh, how do I do this? Well, uh, add self-weight, because initially we assumed self-weight was zero, and we know this, this isn't the case. So what I, need, what I then need to do is, I need to add a uh, weight ultimate dead. I need to basically convert my, uh, say here, well, I know that my, um, how might I say this? I know my weight is 84. Um, I know that my weight is 84 pounds per foot. Uh, or this is also, I need to factor this though. So I need to say this is 0.12 times 0.084. That is the weight in pounds per foot expressed in kips per foot. And so that would be 0 0.101 kip feet. 0 0.101 kip feet. And then I just need to go and add these back into my shear and bending moment diagrams. And so if you do this, you'll end up with a um, you'll end up with a new shear and bending moment diagram. And I'll just go ahead and draw this out. I think you know how to do this at this point. There'll be a another distributed load. There'll be another uh, there'll be another shear and bending moment diagram, et cetera, et cetera. But you'll end up with a shear and bending moment diagram that looks like this uh, here. Or let's, I'm not concerned with shear right now, but let's just say you'll end up with a moment that looks like this. Uh, and so you'll end up with, and this would actually be parabolic, so our moment will actually increase. It's going to be 618. We'll have 824 up here. Uh, 618 again symmetric. And then back to zero. And this will still, and this will now be parabolic because of the distributed load. Uh, present from our w or from our self weight, but it doesn't include it. It doesn't increase it that much, and that's ultimately why we're able to do our initial sizing. Uh, why that's why it's useful. To that's why it's still useful to do initial sizing ignoring self weight because we went from 800 to 824. We really didn't increase it that much. Uh, but then um, basically what we're going to do is uh, next we will repeat a section. We then need to repeat all of the previous steps two through seven, including the self-weight. So uh, maybe I can do this in, uh, maybe I'll just label this as a step. That would actually, that's big enough for its own step. Step eight, uh, that's the wrong color, blue. Uh, step eight, repeat, and I'm not gonna work, work all the way through this uh, to save time in the video, uh, repeat steps two through seven and verify. Verify that, uh, verify all of our capacities. R verify uh, as we did before that uh, phi MP for this section is greater than M ultimate. And also verify that uh, our phi MN 
that this will have a, a greater, that basically MU over CB is still good. MU over CB is still greater than our capacity at 10 feet, greater than the value from the table. Uh, the same uh, value we've seen previously. Uh, 310. Okay, uh, then, or uh, actually greater, uh, but I uh, probably should say less than here. Okay, anyway, and if we get our CB values here, so I don't necessarily want to work, work all the way through here, but we could actually end up, if we, we, do, if we do calculate M, uh, M ultimate over CBs, we'll end up with this here, M ultimate divided by CB. Actually, I'm going to do it here, so let's work through that. M ultimate over CBs, when you run through this, divided by CB uh, is going to be 370, depending on the span, I'll just kind of write it below here, it will be 370 comma for one, first section, segment one, two, three, and four. Maybe I'll do a line instead of a comma. 370, uh, 742, 742, and 370. And no problem there. And so yes, our, our, we're not going to have any problem getting that. Looking at the looking at the table three ten, our uh, our shape is well above this at a length of ten feet. Uh, it looks like at a length of ten feet, uh, our capacity is what uh, for our W uh, twenty four by eighty four here. It looks like at ten feet we have a capacity of about oh uh, let's see where is that at? Well, it's definitely way above that. It's actually on. I have to go to the next page, not 3-113, probably 3-111, uh, and it looks like it's about 765. So at 10, basically at uh, LB equals 10 feet, at LB equals 10 feet, this thing has an M, when CB is 1.0, when CB is 1.0, uh, this has a capacity VMN equals uh, about, like I said previously, uh, about, sorry, uh, 765 kips, or kip feet. And that is greater than 742. So that means, uh, again, this is CB of 1.0, the sort of more conservative case. And so if it's going to be good at 765 when CB is 1.0, when we actually have a CB uh, that's not that, we'll have uh, our, our ML ultimate over CB, uh, basically, again, the... Uh, M ultimate divided by CB uh, must be less than the VMN when CB equals 1.0. And that is true. And also, we need to check again. Uh, check if uh, VMP uh, is greater than M ultimate. And that's no problem either because the, the plastic moment capacity isn't going to change. It's the same section. Uh, so that's going to be 840. Is that greater than our ultimate load here of 824? And yes, it is. So we're actually, we can prove this without even running through any of the full calculations of the uh, manual. Uh, but anyway, we do have other things we need to be aware of though. And step eight would be looking at other miscellaneous uh, loading conditions, including deflection. Uh, so we know this is going to be good in terms of primary bending strength capacity. Step eight. Step eight, or actually, I should, uh, let's say, sorry, step nine, would be to calculate, uh, check basically everything else. And the reason I lump all this into one step is that usually this stuff isn't going to control. Uh, check shear. Uh, deflection, web crippling, and web yielding. Uh, web crippling and web yielding. And web yielding. All right, so let's look at uh, deflect now um, here. We could go and check through those. Uh, I've already looked at, I've already shown you how to do deflection. I'm sorry, I've already shown you how to do, uh, I've already shown you how to do uh, 
say shear calculations, those aren't very, very critical. Those aren't very difficult. It's not very critical. So instead, I'm just going to leave that as an exercise to y'all. What I would like to do is I would like to run through a deflection calculation. So let's do that here. Deflection. Deflection. Okay. So uh, let's go to table 3-22 and find our uh, relevant case here. And let's see if we can find it. Okay, let's consider tab uh, table 3 dash, actually, sorry, 3 dash 23 here. Well, actually, let's take a look. Yes, so. Hmm. Well, actually, we can use any number of things. We could use table 3-23, uh, but I'm going to actually use table 3-22, the concentrated load equivalents. So I'm going to use uh, table 3-22A, concentrated load equivalents. So my first step is I want to look at concentrated load equivalents. And this is found on page 3-28 of the 15th edition of the manual. Concentrated load equivalents. And um, we're going to use case uh, four, in the case where we have three point loads. Uh, case four, where we have three point loads. And we can see that there are uh, there is going to be the equation max deflection. And so basically it has a variety of, basically how this table works is there are a series of cases. And then based on what you want to calculate, whether it's max deflection, max fixed end reaction, all sorts of things, you look down below, and, it, and the, this table provides the coefficients for those given equations. So we're looking at the max deflection. Basically, it says delta max is equal to E, and this is a fat, lowercase e, this is a factor that basically is uh, getting the equivalent point load. And I'll show you how to work with this. Uh, e times P, uh, L to the third over EI. capital EI. And so uh, for this here, or for our case where we have three point loads, E is going to be 0 0.05. So 0 0.05 times a P times or whatever that point load is, uh, times L to the third over EI. And it's going to be very important when we're doing this to watch your units. The most common thing screwed up when you work with deflection calculations is the units. Because look at this. We're going to have a uh, point load in kips. Uh, we're going to have, this is the 0.05 is unitless, but length is in feet, E is in uh, ki uh, kips per square inch, I is in inches to the fourth. If you're not careful, you're going to screw up the units. Uh, so here, let's consider this. Uh, let's see. And the delta max is going to be uh, 0 0.05 times 27.5 uh, times 40 times 12 to the third. Uh, this is converting the length to inches. And 29,000 times 2370. So first I'm going to do, uh, and this is the delta max, uh, let's say from P. Delta max from P, from the point loads. We'll also need to consider the self-weight. Now, uh, if you remember from the previous problem, something may, seem, something may pop out at you. And that's this here, this 27.5. Where did that come from? What is that? We've been working with 40 the whole time, point loads of, uh, we've been working way since way back here with point loads of 40 but if you remember those are factored loads and where this and this in deflection we're working with service loads 
So we don't want to use the factored loads. We want to use the service loads. Service loads. Okay. And if I have my notes right, if I uh, multiplied all this correctly, which might not. Let me go ahead and check my numbers on this. Uh, I got z uh, 2.212 uh, 2 inches. So uh, let's see. And then if I want to go and calculate how much of this is from uh, both dead and live, let's, let's consider that. How much of this is from dead and how much of this is from live? Um, so in other words, uh, I could actually calculate this independently. Uh, maybe, and the reason I need to do that is because there are different, uh, there may be different uh, loading conditions uh, allowable depending, but anyway, we'll see. Uh, so just uh, delta dead here is going to be uh, 10 times, uh, let's say here, 10 over uh, basically 27.5 is our dead times uh, 2.212 or 0 0.805 inches. Basically, I can just multiply by, by the load here. And I can do that because the load is linear. There's no power there. I can just multiply by the ratios. Uh, so if we need that, we have it, 0 0.805 inches from just the dead. Then from the live, the delta L, the deflection just from the live load, uh, would be 2.212, uh, but this time times seven, the, ratio, the ratio of the live to the total load, 17.5 over 27.5, uh, and then inches times 2.212 inches, and this comes to 1.408 inches. Then what I also want to do though is I want to include the self-weight in this. So let's include the self-weight. Uh, I know we also need to include self-weight deflection. That's going to be important. The self-weight deflection And the equation is going to be delta max, and you can just look, you can find the equation in the steel manual or any mechanics materials book for the deflection of a uniformly distributed load. This is going to be 5 uh, times W L to the fourth over 384 EI, or you could derive it if you wanted to have some fun. And so this is going to be 5 times uh, 0.084 over 12. This is the service dead load, and then I'm dividing by 12 to convert to uh, a, a kips per in, a foot to a kips per inch. Uh, so this is this is the uh, self weight unfactored in kips per inch times the length of 40 times 12. Again, converting to inches uh, to the fourth power divided by 384. Um, here from, I should probably put that delta max self. Uh, so um, 384 times 29,000, uh, the, the uh, KSI of the steel, and then times the modulus of, sorry, the moment of inertia of our section. If you look in the sec section properties, you will find that this is 2,370 inches to the fourth power. And then if you go and multiply all this nonsense out, this comes to not very much, much less than this, but still substantial, 0 0.0708 inches, 0 0.0708 inches. So finally, I need to then, well, maybe not finally, but then I need to get my total deflection. And this would just be adding all these together. So basically dead plus live plus self-weight delta total um, is going to be 2.212 inches, 2.212 uh, inches, plus the delta we got from the self-weight, which is 0 .70, 0 0.0708 inches. And that comes to a total deflection of 2.283 inches. So this is what we are basically applying to the structure. What is allowed though? So ultimately all of this is gonna come down to uh, delta actual or delta total must be less than or equal to delta allowable. 
Well, let's find that. So uh, there are different criteria used, and really it would depend on what this particular beam is being used for. I didn't, I didn't provide that for you, so let's just look at a couple possibilities. Uh, so criteria, allowable, delta allowable, Well, uh, let's look at our two, different, two main ones we tend to use, L over 240 and L over 360. Well, L over 240, this would be 40 times 12. Again, you have to convert to inches, the length of inches, so 40 feet times 12 inches per foot, or uh, there, uh, divided by 240. That is uh, two inches. And the more stringent, uh, this would be if you did 40 times 12 divided by 360, you would get 1.33 inches. Uh-oh. Look here. Delta total is greater than each of these. Delta total here is not less than delta allowable, regardless of which one we're choosing. Uh, if we had only gotten uh, under this one, or sorry, only under this one, but and we were between these, maybe we could make an argument this is okay, but it's not. Delta total is actually greater than delta allowable. This beam for deflection is no good. So beam is no good in deflection. And so maybe, so this is, this is a good illustration of why deflection often controls. So this is no good. We have to select a different beam. And this is, off, this is a good example of why deflection often controls. You see, we can increase the capacity, uh, never beyond the, the plastic capacity, but we can often increase the strength capacity of a beam simply by, uh, uh, simply by uh, say, um, we can increase the capacity simply by bracing it at more points. But deflection doesn't care about bracing. Ultimately, you know, deflection is all based on E and I, and that's it. It doesn't care about bracing. So what do we do? Well... There's a couple options. So we could just completely redesign it, but let's say uh, for now that our deflection criteria were uh, the, uh, is the uh, L over 240 condition. So let's say deflection a deflection criteria is L over 240. Uh, or in this case, this would be equal to two, uh, just two inches. So really, we have two choices. And this will some, somewhat depends on the method of your project or your, the criteria of your project. Uh, really, two options at this point. So uh, let's look at option one, redesign. If deflect, if the strength is if, if strength is your failure point, well then you really do have to redesign. You don't really have uh, no uh, any other option, but you could just redesign, redesign the beam, uh, redesign the beam, uh, selecting a shape based on ix. Select a shape based on ix. Uh, the strong moment, uh, strong bend, strong axis moment of inertia. Uh, you know, in other words, and you can find that via table 3.3 would be very uh, useful uh, table for you, design aid. Um, basically, you're going to select an, uh, a shape, a shape that has enough I to resist this, to produce less than two inch deflection. Uh, select a shape uh, to pr that will produce so basically, you would solve, back solve the deflection equation for your ix, and then select a shape that will um, be able to withstand that. Select a shape that will um, have less, uh, have the required i, the required moment of inertia. However, I will give you a warning here. If you do this, you still have to check all of the all of the strength checks again still must recheck all strength considerations. Having enough I is a very easy way to prove that you have uh, sufficient capacity or sufficient strength to, uh, to produce a low enough deflection, but it doesn't say anything about your actual strength. So you have to go, you have to go back, 
and recheck these. So recheck all strength requirements. Uh, requirements. Must recheck all strength requirements. So that's option one, and that will take a while, but really, uh, if you know what you're doing, if you, especially if you're, just, if you're using, say, like uh, MathCAD or other problem, uh, programs like that, won't really be too difficult. Just read all, just basically do everything we did, but again. Uh, and then, but depending on your project, there is another option. Option two, you could actually camber your beam. Could camber your beam. C-A-M-B-E-R. Now, if you're not familiar with cambering, basically the idea is um, you can specify a camber to resist to uh, uh, eliminate your dead load def deflection. You could specify, but only dead load def deflection. This doesn't work for live load because uh, because otherwise you just have deflection in the opposite direction normally. Uh, so you can specify a camber to eliminate your dead load deflection entirely. And I'll describe what camber means if you're not familiar. But again, dead, this is only good for dead load deflection. Only. So for example, if I make a beam, now, uh, usually I consider beams as horizontal, but there is actually no reason that we can't build a beam that has a pre-built arc into it. So you can actually uh, order a beam. Now, the downside, of course, is that this is more expensive, but you can actually order a beam that's basically an arc. Now this is not, I'm drawing it more uh, dramatically than it really is. It's a slight arc in reality. So you have a simply supported beam like this. And uh, so when you, when you initially hang it up, basically it's on a arc, it's curved initially. It's, it's, and I, I'm definitely exaggerating this. It's curved, you know, a fraction of an inch, not, you know, if this it looks like this thing is curved 10 feet in the air or something crazy like that. But uh, in reality, that would be just the, uh, it's curved up in the air at a level that would be equal to your dead load deflection. So you're, you curve it up, you design it so it has a little bit of an arc to it, and that arc is equal to your calculated uh, delta D, your dead load deflection. And the beauty of this system of doing this is that once you put the dead load back on it, once you pour the floor slab above it, once you put every, the, whatever beams or uh, joists or whatever it's carrying, it's going to deflect back into a horizontal position. So you're relying on the dead load to put it back under, uh, to put it back uh, horizontal. So you don't want to do this for live load though, because then your floor will be bouncing and stuff, and it will still have deflection. You can't; it would just be basically opposite deflection when the live load is not there. So we can't really rely on that. But you can use this to eliminate uh, dead load deflection. This is really why previously I separated out the dead and the live, because the remaining, uh, the remaining. So here I might just say, I could just specify on my drawing, uh, use camber equal to 0 0.875 inches. And I would just build my beams with that. I would order like the, I would order them like that from the, from the steel mill. They'd be delivered to the site with a slight arc in them. And we'll hopefully install them right side up. But if you don't, you're going to have uh, twice as much deflection as you, or dead load deflection as you're hoping for. So if you're going to do this, be, do, do take uh, very extreme care to make sure you install them the right way up. But uh, that's probably not going to, that's probably not going to be a problem, but you never know. Constructability and all, all, and all that. It can be when you're, uh, you know, you're an iron worker, you're an iron worker, you know, 80 feet up in the air, and you have a tenth of an inch deflection, uh, camber, tenth of an inch camber, you never know. But uh, anyway, so if we just specify this, the remaining, the remaining deflection from live load will suddenly fall under our allowable limits. So the remaining deflection. is uh, 1.408 inches. This is less than two inches. And then thus we can say we are good. So I'm gonna be lazy and for this problem say this is fine. We can just use camber. Uh, but this will really depend on the specifics of your project. So um, whether that's acceptable or not really depends on just the project. I, ca I can't tell you in advance whether that's acceptable or not. So. Um, that just depends on what type of project you're working on, what kind of structure you're doing, etc. So, uh, benefits, drawbacks, of course. Well, uh, well, obviously, it's going to be more expensive. If you, uh, if you're, uh, if I want a beam that, and I'm telling a uh, steel mill, 
oh, don't just make it, you know, 40 feet long in this shape I, and this section. I, but I want you to give it a tiny, you know, you try manufacturing a beam that has a, you know, 0.875 inch uh, uh, arc, uh, vertical arc on it that's 40 feet long and it's nice and symmetric and everything else. That's not an easy thing to do. Well, they make it seem easy, I'm sure. But uh, uh, that's if I gave you a piece of wood and told you to, to make a camber like that, that'd be very difficult. So, or material that you could shape by hand. Um, anything that big with that, you know, that small of an arc is going to be difficult to do, but it can be done. So the downside of course is that yes, it can be done, but like anything else, if you want it done, it's going to cost more money. It's going to cost money. It's going to cost time. Uh, and then your constructability also becomes more critical. So this, you also mean, this also means that your constructability becomes more issue, becomes a bigger issue. So for example, uh, you might have, um, if you're not using a camber, the nice thing is, is that you can just, you have, you, for one thing you might be able to do, for example, is, uh, if you're using a bunch of the same, if, if you're using a, a bunch of one section, you can just order a whole bunch of that one length of beam and just put it out in the yard and you, and cut it and use it as you need it. And so you might have, you know, just like you would, you know, two by fours or something, you just have a bunch of, uh, have a bunch of, uh, you know, W40 by or W, uh, 24 by whatever and et cetera, et cetera. And you just pick them up and cut them the length you need. And you put them on the, on your frame, you know, bolt them up, weld them up according to allowable designs, et cetera. Uh, so you can basically one 20 foot long section is as good as, is good or one 40 foot long section is just as good as another 20, uh, as, as another 40 foot long section. One of the problems with cambering is that if you, uh, suddenly then you can't do that. Because now, yes, if you have multiple beams, each under the same loading, that's fine. But suddenly now one W, uh, I guess what did we use here? We used a W24 uh, by 84, I believe. Uh, each, what was that? Not, losing my notes. W24 by 84. Yes. So uh, again, when we uh, have not cambered it, one W24, w, one W24 by 84 is just as good as another 25 by 84. But if I have a, do a dozen different 24 by 84s in my, uh, in my building and they're each under slightly different dead load, well, I'm going to have to order them with each, I'm going to have to order each one of them with a slightly different camber. And then now I could just, you know, pick the worst one and try to eliminate that way and specify the same camera on all of them. But then I'd have to check that to make sure each one still has the allowable deflection, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're not careful, you may end up with a situation where every single beam is custom made and custom built and have to, has to be put down into one particular spot. And maybe, you know, your client is happy paying for that. Maybe that's just, maybe that's just tired to business. Maybe that's fine. So I don't know the specifics of your project. I don't, I don't know the specifics, the specifics of your industry, but my point really is that while cameraing can be useful, it is certainly not a magic bullet. So it does come with its own uh, drawbacks as well. It, the two main drawbacks are one, cost and ordering materials, and also constructability it becomes more difficult. Okay. All right, that will conclude for my long form example here. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this is finally the end of lecture 14 and the end of my, ser my uh, videos here on steel beam design. The next, the next lecture, we'll start talking about uh, concrete beam design. All right, uh, actually concrete deflect uh, beam deflection, I believe. So, all right, that'll do it for tonight. And as always, thank you.